Welcome. So I am uh, Olof, and I am uh, here on behalf of Campcom Research and Technology and Fossi Foundation. I'll talk about FUSAC, which is my main project I've been doing for the last seven years. So about myself, I am a bit of a failed uh, project manager. Uh, I'm a viral tweeter. I'm a co-founder and director of the Fossi Foundation. I organize these kind of conferences. I'm also an award-winning CPU architect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to talk about FUSAC. So we have heard that SymbiFlow wants to be the GCC for FPGA. We know that RISC-V wants to be the Linux of the hardware world. We know that uh, LGraph wants to be the LLVM for silicon. So FUSAC wants to be your aptget, or your NPM, or your Cargo, or your PyPy. Uh, whatever you call for different languages. So it's a package manager, and it's also your CMake or auto tools, because it's a build tool abstraction for HGL. Um, so if we look at FUSOC, uh, it's, it's, you invoke it as a command line uh, application. It can also be used as a library if you want to integrate it in something else. You request an operation on a core. For example, say that you want to run a simulation on core called A, and you want to run it with the tool Verilator. Uh, FUSAC will look up uh, its library of cores that it finds, uh, either locally or on the internet. Uh, you have a concept of local cores, where you store uh, a core description file together with your RTL files, or you can have a remote core, where you uh, have your uh, core description file separated from your code. So it, in that case, FUSAC will automatically fetch the files it needs for you. It then calculate all the dependencies, uh, because I mean, HDL development is a highly hierarchical and modular thing, uh, so this is an excellent opportunity to use recursive dependencies. Uh, it will flatten the dependency tree, uh, pass it to a um, tool generic interface, which I called EDAM, which stands for EDAM metadata. Also, EDAM is a cheese with a fancy wrapper, and this is basically a fancy wrapper. Uh, <laughs> EDAM, uh, then it takes, uh, oh, EDLIST takes over, which is another part of FUSOC, uh, and generates the tool specific project files. Because one difference between software and silicon development is for software, if you do a C program, you can target either GCC or LLVM, and you pretty much can just exchange these. You might need some other parameters, some small changes, but in the ADA world, we have at least two dozen different tools. So a big part of FUSOC is to uh, target all these different tools and create tool-specific project files for all of them. So if we look at the, a bit about the back-end part, the right-hand side part of the uh, last slide, uh, we have an EDEM file, which is a tool-agnostic uh, description of the files. It goes through a setup stage where it creates these project files. Uh, and this in this phase, you can stop if you want to open your Vivada GUI or your Quartus GUI, you can just do that and be done. Then you don't, have to need, don't need to use FUSOC for anything else. But you can also let FUSOC build the thing. And building is different for different DDA tools. For uh, a linter tool, the build, the lint, the build stage would uh, do the linting. For a simulation tool, it would build a simulation model. And for a synthesis tool, it would provide you with an ASIC netlist or a FPGA image. And for things like simulator, simulators, we can also have a separate run stage which actually runs the simulation. And you can do like you can do the setup and build step first, and then you can run uh, parameterized runs uh, of the same model uh, with different inputs, so you don't need to have to rebuild the model every time. And you can add hooks, script hooks between each stage if you want to extract some information from, uh, for example, uh, get the fmax of the FPGA running. So FUSOC currently has um, 14 backends, I think. Um, um. Yeah, FUSOC has 15 backends uh, for different tools. The latest one is a tool called uh, Ascent Lint from Real Intent. This is a third linting tool. So why do you want to use FUSOC? Well, there are many uh, cases, but the two main things is to increase portability and reduce maintenance. 
increase portability by not having to maintain and, and uh, by make it easy to target new platforms. You can target simulators, you can target uh, FPGA uh, images, FPGA synthesis tools, different boards from different vendors, uh, and just have to change the things that actually are needed, uh, which is mostly like constraint files and uh, the part that you're talking to, and uh, in some cases, some special parameters needed for a certain uh, simulation tool. Also to reduce maintenance. I heard someone say that code is a cost, not an asset, and I think that's very true. Uh, in software world, you, you, you use a lot of standard libraries. If you're using C, you use libc. If you're using Python, you have a whole library of different things. You can just concentrate on the things you really want to do, your value add, and reuse a lot of the different stuff. So it is currently probably the most used package manager for these kind of things. It's not that it's too much competition. Uh, but also a couple of key points, it's non-intrusive. You just need to add your core description file. Uh, you don't have to make, it doesn't put any extra burden on your project structure. You can pretty much structure your code as you like. You don't even need to store your core description file together with your project. You can st uh, store it uh, somewhere else and have it reference a GitHub repo, for example, uh, where the code is. It's modular, uh, it's extendable. I uh, will go into generator soon. It's resourceful. You have hundreds of different IP cores already packaged for it. Uh, I, do, I package many cores myself. I do know that there are other people, uh, some in this room, who have also packaged many uh, FUSA cores, and hopefully we have a growing ecosystem over time. It's battle proven. It's been around for seven years. Uh, it has been used to package uh, a lot of cores that I haven't written myself, which is a very good way to, uh, to um, uh, see that, to, to kill your assumptions about certain things. I packaged low risk, I packaged pulp platform, which are probably two of the larger ones. I tried to package NVDLA, it took a lot of time. Uh, so just a, a small use case. Um, this is an example where I run FUSOC uh, on a core called Serve which you might have heard about, uh, with a target called sim. I will go into targets later on, but it's basically like you make file targets. You can have a target for simulation, you can have a target for different boards. Uh, and it will use the default simulator as described in the core description file. Uh, I can then change the tool to something else, uh, and that's the only change I need to do in most cases. Uh, I might come across some simulator um, problem that makes me need to set some, disable some warning flags or something like that and the FUSA core description files support uh, disabling and enabling options per target and per tool. So this is a simple example of what it can look like. You have a name which is a VLNV identifier which is a concept taken from IPXACT. So you have four segments of your name, it's a vendor, library name and a version. In this case both vendor and libraries uh, empty. Uh, you have a couple of file sets. Uh, you have a parameter. And as you see the, in the target sections on the right side, uh, you have a default target, which is used when this core is being a dependency of other cores. And then you have a, a test target, which is used when this is invoked uh, as a top level uh, test bench. And in the test target, you see we pull in both the RTL and the TB file sets. Also, depending on if you were running uh, Verilator, we will also pull in uh, the TB Verilator file set. So there's a very simple um, uh, conditionals also inspired from uh, Gentoo's uh, eBuild system. Uh, also, top level, you can see you can uh, it's different top levels depending on uh, if you were using Verilator or not. But otherwise, it's very tool agnostic. You can probably run this with any of the, I think it's eight different simulators supported by uh, FUSOC right now. One thing is that there are many things not written in Verilog and BHDL, and FUSOC doesn't know anything about the code. It will just uh, bypass the things. You can, you can set which type of file you have. 
but all these types of files need to be supported by the EDA tools. And the EDA tools don't support Chisel, they don't support MyGen, they don't support the IPSX files, they don't support ELF files or anything like that. So what we'll use is a generator, and a generator is something that takes something and uh, converts it to something that the EDA tools can understand. It can be compiling an ELF file down to a um, um, hex file that can be read by dollar read mem page in, in Verilog, or it can be uh, an application that takes an IPXX file and creates a top level uh, wrapper. It can be something that runs MyGen to produce a Verilog file. So in your core, you have a, a TTP TTDG, which is a thing that passes things to the generator. We couldn't find a better name for that. Thank you, Ben. Um, and then it will pass things to the generator and you will have a generated core back and it will be dynamically inserted into the Fusoc uh, dependency tree when, when the flow is running. So from an outside perspective, Fusoc can support uh, MyGen and Chisel and things like that um, with a generator, which is kind of a plug-in system, really. So uh, this was all good. Uh, Fusoc and Needle Eyes were very good friends, um, but at some point they realized they only talked to each other through a standardized API, uh, didn't have very much in common. So they decided to split up uh, and meet new ones. So these are some ideas for the future. So Fusoc will now, Fusoc originally was the whole thing, but Fusoc now is uh, just producing this EDAM file, uh, this uh, tool agnostic description, and then it puts all your files in a build tree, and then Edelice will take over from there. So for example, we can have Fusoc if you want to use the Fusoc uh, dependency generation, uh, the Fusoc core description files, and just have it output a, a tool agnostic file, you can do that, and then you can have something else uh, pick that up and run its backend flow. But the probably more common use case is to actually use Edelize, uh, because I've seen many projects that are written, writing their own EDA tool wrappers, and everyone supports a different subset. MyGen has some, uh, some, uh, Cactus 2 has some, uh, iStudio has some with the uh, API or stuff. So what I am hoping is that we can all collaborate on, uh, on a single description or single interface for EDA, wrapping EDA tools. Uh, and this is something that the MyHGL people and the Cactus 2 people are already interested in. Uh, and MyGen, which is a successor to MyGen, is looking at integrating Edelize now. Uh, so I really hope to, if anyone, if anyone is writing an EDA tool wrapper, please don't, please use Edelize. There's all these little small things like how you quote a string with a space, things like that, that always gets, people get wrong. Um, so, uh, in the near future we are looking at adding more generators, the support is there but they would like to support more complex use cases, uh, more more common generators that can be reused among projects. Uh, I am also looking at adding uh, form of vacation flow with symbiosis. It's no problem, it's just I haven't had time to do it. Uh, a more important thing is the support for use flags, which is a way to conditionally disable and enable parts of your core description file uh, from the command line. Uh, this has many, many use cases. Uh, like, for example, if you want to add an Ethernet core with an uh, RGMII converter in front of it, you can just pass a use flag that enables it, and if it doesn't enable it, you will only get the GMII uh, version, things like that. <coughs> in the long-term future, we are looking at the LibreCourse integration. If you have been using Python, who, has anyone used Python here? Yeah, okay, a few. Um, you know that uh, you can, you can, you don't need to have a library of, of what's available. You all you need is access to the PyPy website, and then you can say, "Hey, I want this core, and I want all, all this module, and I want all the dependencies on this module." And it will query this PyPy website. And this is what we're looking at with LibreCores uh, to uh, have Fusoc query LibreCores for for cores, and also. When you add a project to LibreCourse, you would somehow automatically, if you have a few core description file, it will automatically pick it up uh, and have things 
more integrated. It lies everywhere. Also, I wanted to become my industry standard, world domination, things like that. I like world domination. Um, yeah, thanks. Cool. Questions? I, I have a question. How much, like, <clears throat> after you've packaged an IP, how, uh, like, does it break? Like, how much maintenance is it to keep a packaged IP working? Uh, it might, it might break on, on the new tool versions. Uh, some of the tools are very bad at their quality control. Uh, it might also break if you have, uh, if it, that core has other dependencies and they are moving. Uh, you can, uh, you can write a range of dependencies that you want it, or range, version range of a dependency. So you can say it must be at least 1.0 and at most 2.0 or something like that. Um, uh, but I'm also looking at adding package lock files so you can be sure to have exact versions. But uh, most of these cores are pretty stable once there are nothing moving. And with the few SOC description files, they don't have to live with the IP, right? They can live in a separate place and then you just reference them and it knows where to get the IP from. Yeah, and that is also an important thing. If you look at, for example, downloading uh, uh, like memory models from Micron or something like that, you are not allowed to share these things. Uh, so Fuso gets around this by uh, having the core description separate. So you will download it to your own cache, but you will not, I would don't have to distribute it. Also, for external cores, uh, there's an option to patch things on the fly. So if there's an IP where the original developer don't want to change anything, you can add a patch on top of that automatically. And if, sorry, how much work is it to actually package an IP? Like, like how many minutes would you say? Uh, it's not as much. I mean, for simple IP, it's like 10 minutes, five minutes. It's just a short YAML file. Um, I wanted to know, oh, so since you're not using LibreCores yet, it's mostly fetching from GitHub, GitLab, like from Git repos, uh, when you say I want to go get this dependency? Yeah, so I have something I call provider, uh, which is backends for different uh, storages. Uh, it's currently, currently has a GitHub provider, an SVN provider, a URL, URL provider, and an open course provider, because that's had to be, be special. Uh, but you can add providers there are like 20 lines of code, something like that. And the, the uh, what am I trying to say? The package format, it's, you're supposed to use something like semantic versioning uh, across those, or can you, can you pin the hashes and things <laughs> like that? Uh, so uh, I realized that this was already a lost battle. Uh, there's been so many bad uh, versioning practices, and I mean, I'm using some of these IPs are perfectly fine, but they're 20 years old. Uh, so uh, I, I haven't, I'm not forcing uh, the use of semantic versioning. I encourage it, but there are, is no, nothing to enforce it. Okay, thank you. Do you still have to log in to clone from open cores? Oh yes. Whose login do you use? <laughs> One called OrbSock. <laughs> Funny, okay. Why not to use some existing package manager like NPM? That's a very good question uh, and something I looked up a lot uh, when I started it. Also, why didn't I use WAF or SCONS or AutoTools or CMake for the build part? Um, and it turns out that this is, a, uh, this is a slightly different problem. Many of the package managers out there are, uh, use uh, binary packages. Not all, but many of them. And they, these are ruled out automatically because we can't uh, distribute uh, binary packages. Uh, also, the many package managers, they are dealing with phases like, they, they end at the installation, basically. But we are not, this, this looks a bit different because we have a, we run these things, we don't install them. It's, it's not really the same. It, there's a bit of mismatch of concepts, I have found. Uh, and it's not very easy to, override these assumptions that are made uh, on the software package managers. That's my view of this. I have one more question. Oh, I have a question. If I was to package 
an IP for fuse sort. Where would I then submit the YAML file that I write? Uh, if, it's, if it's of general use, you can submit it to the FUSOC base library, which has things like uh, Fifers and stuff, and that's also where I'm interested to add base jump support, because that would give us a lot of base standard library IP. Uh, but in many cases, you can just keep it on your GitHub repo, uh, because FUSOC also has a library concept, so you can use, write FUSOC library add, and then a name and, um, uh, and a URL. And it will add this as a library. And the library can consist of one or many cores. And the one who wrote support for that is probably here today. Yes, he's in the back. <laughs> um, so how can we contribute and help you achieve world domination? And um, in what ways? Yeah, uh, I'll give you my account number later. <laughs> No, but uh, I really want to see more more packages because it needs to be a living ecosystem. Uh, I'm doing much of the work. Also, support for more tools, um, and especially when it comes to commercial tools, I don't have access to many of them myself. Uh, also, help with bug fixing. But these, everyone needs help with bug fixing. But more more practical things are like new backends, more cores. Uh, would be very interested in. Uh, okay, so as like a concrete example, uh, I'm doing a project and there's a really good core that I like, but the person who wrote it didn't package it. Uh, and so I create a core. Do I submit that core? Do I just use it personally? Am I, do I get the person's permission before I start maintaining this like package file for them? Um, is there a implied ownership? Am I now the maintainer of that particular core? Like what is, uh, what's the, maybe even what is the ideal like path that you imagine in that kind of situation? Yeah, that's a very good question. So it's, it's about the government's model basically. Uh, and for, for course of, uh, that has a very broad utility, like say five or something like that, uh, and they are well maintained and they are good quality, I would have liked to have them in the FUSOC base library. Um, if, if you have someone else's core, uh, then, and you can, um, if, if you don't have the permission and you don't want to ask for permission or you don't get the permission and it's open source, you can still add your own repository and uh, patch, uh, add patches and, and, and just uh, use a remote core that uh, addresses this, uh, the original code. Uh, I will not, I mean if you say that you're a maintainer or something, I will, uh, I appreciate it, but I will not uh, blame you if, if you stop maintaining it. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's... Okay. Cool. Oh. Uh, do you have any, um, like, CI pipeline, since you have this, like, proliferation of tools and, like, you're making changes to make sure that the changes you're making to FUSOC don't uh, break the integrations you have with all these other tools? No, and th this is a problem, and this is something we're also looking at with the CI uh, integration for LibreCores. Uh, ideally, it would be that if someone up uploads a new version of their core on LibreCores, the CI pipeline will run that. If, the, if it has any tests, it will run that. And since it's FUSOC, it will automatically be able to discern if, if w how to run the tests uh, on it. Uh, and it will also do reverse dependency tracking and things like that. That would be the ideal case. It's not where we are today. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me. I was actually asking about FUSOC itself. During oh, FUSOC, yeah, FUSOC has, uh, has CI. Um, but this is also hard. The things that are most likely to break are the commercial tools where I don't have access to the tools because I use mockups of, uh, of the tools and just checking the input and output. Uh, so the last step is always hard to verify because I don't have access to tools. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, no. Thank you, Olaf.